This is the playlist where I drink good wine while I whine about bad books. And today's offender is The Mask of Mirrors by M.A. Carrick, which are, is a set of dual authors writing under the same pen name. And whoo boy, this was, this was something. The unfortunate thing is it actually had a really good premise. So let's take a look at the back cover copy to see what the story promised. Fortune favors the bold. Magic favors the liars. Ren is a con artist who has come to the sparkling city of Nadezra with one goal, to trick her way into a noble house, securing her fortune and her sister's future. But her masquerade is just one of many, and as corrupt nightmare magic begins to weave its way through the city of dreams, the poisonous feuds of its nobility and the shadowy dangers of its impoverished underbelly become tangled with Ren at their heart. So I do want to preface this review by saying that it is solely about the book, not about the authors as people. And also, this is going to have many spoilers. I have a lot to talk about. So let's dive into the review. So let me start off the review with some nice things about the book. I will say, again, the plot is there. The back cover sounds really interesting. And the writing style is there. I think they're obviously both very talented authors. There are just some things that could have been done to improve this book. I also think the descriptions are really good. Um, even without the map, I felt like the city was very vibrant. It was very alive. I could picture it in my head. I could picture the characters in my head. So I do give them props for that. For that. Uh, the world building in the story honestly could have been great, but it really felt like the authors leaned really heavily into describing mundane details in lieu of explaining anything. Like, the best analogy I've come up with is this book is Ben Wyatt meets Rosetta Stone. So I'm talking about like Ben's Cones of Dunshire game. Like it's complex and convoluted and it seems like nobody really understands it. And then there's the Rosetta Stone aspect, which comes in as the book throws a bunch of words and terms at you without translating, defining, or explaining them. Well, actually, <laughs> I was about 20 pages in and contemplating DNFing this as I felt completely lost in the story. I did not understand what was going on. And so I started looking at reviews when I w read one that said, there's a glossary at the back of the book. And I kid you not, at the back of the book, there is a glossary. And there's also a cast of all the characters because there are like 50 some characters that you have to keep track of. And then, yep, you have a glossary, but it also does not define everything. like. It was also a lot to have to flip to the back of the book just to try to understand what was going on instead of weaving those definitions into the actual story it just it kind of threw it at you and it was like if you're that interested go look it up in the glossary and it's like but that's not my job like my job is to just read and immerse myself in the story if i have to flip to the back to like look up a stupid word it feels like i'm studying for a test it is not the immersive reading experience that i would have hoped for plus there are different names for months days, directions, even like left and right. It's like earthwise and sunwise. It honestly took me way too long to realize that it's timestamps at the start of new chapters or in story breaks. Like, because again, everything has its own definition or different name. So like flip to a random page, page 82, the kind, so it's opening up on chapter four, the kindly spinner, plaza, Cascanum, the pearls, Sweelin eight, and it like because again, Sweelin isn't defined in the back of the book, or at least not that I found. So it took me way too long to understand that these are timestamps. Like, at, maybe I'm just the idiot here, but like I could not figure that one out. Um, it just it really rubbed me the wrong way that like I'm sitting here trying to read this book and don't really understand what's going on because nothing's defined. It is defined, but it's not defined in the story. Going back to other terms that they put in that d they don't really define, even their timekeeping is different. Like, there are times that they're like, oh, it's the third bell. And I'm like, like, are we talking, is that like three in the morning? Like, I don't, I don't understand that. And then they'll later reference things in hours. So why not just keep time the same and tell me what time it is in like hours that I already know? <sighs> I honestly think the book would have benefited from a scene like in Harry Potter 
where the readers learn about the terms and the world at the same time that Harry does, or like our main character does. So obviously the characters know the world, they know the terms, but as readers, we do not. I need some explanations here. I am not familiar with this world or the words that they use to describe it. Again, going back to Harry Potter, I really wish that we had had more world building in like the prologue or maybe even like chapter one where we show Ren coming to, you know, Nadezra or however the hell you say this place's name and she is explaining it to Tess or someone else is explaining it to her. So that way we kind of learn what the different names mean at the same time she does. It would have felt more natural and I wouldn't be sitting here wondering if I'm supposed to understand the terminology or if I'm missing something. Again, the first 20 pages I was flipping through and I just, I really felt like I have no idea what is going on here. And like you expect that in a book, like yeah, it's gonna throw you in the middle of the action, but it was almost too much. Like I just, I, who are these people? What's going on? I also think that it felt like the authors really wanted a rich world, but didn't do the work within the actual story. So the result is a little poor. And as you've already probably noticed, I am definitely going to butcher the words from this book, including places, character names. Even reading it, I didn't know how to pronounce certain characters' names. Like there's an antagonist and it's, you spell her name O-N-D-R-A-K-J-A. -A, and I'm like, is that like Ondraka? Like, are, it, are how, how does that, how is that pronounced? I finally just started calling her Okra because I just, I could not figure it out. One character I straight up renamed in my own head and just started calling her Sybil. I think it was like Sibylat is her name. And then there's a main character, Donaya. I just started calling her Donna. Like after a certain point, I just, I could not, I didn't get a pronunciation guide, so it was very hard to figure out if I was saying these characters' names right. So I just kind of made up my own character names. I already pointed to the character list at the back of the book, but this book has a giant cast of characters. Like every character is fully named, like with a title, what they do, first and last name. It really makes it hard to understand if I'm supposed to keep track of all of these characters or if they were just brought in for one scene. And some of the characters had nicknames or were also undercover themselves. So it's just, it's more names to keep track of. And again, a lot of them don't, don't do a lot in the book. They kind of just appear randomly. And I'm like, I don't remember who you are. Cause some characters would disappear for 300 pages and then make a small appearance and then go away again and then come back and be like, oh yeah, remember this conversation we had 400 pages ago? I do not. <laughs> like I swear, Donaya, Donna, disappeared pretty much after Ren was healed from her like non-sleeping illness. Like, where'd she go? Where's her daughter? Where's her daughter's girlfriend? Like, where are these people? Like, are they just hanging out on the sidelines? Like, what are they doing while all the main action is happening with Ren? I also, at, even going back to like Ren's whole con, I, I don't understand why Ren, when Ren went with the family she did, the Trementis family, like, on the one hand, I do get it in the story because she knew the tremendous family member who, like, defected and left her family, but did Ren not do her research? Like, and she find so essentially she finds out that the tremendous family is going broke. Why does she not decide to back out when she finds out they're not as wealthy as she expected? Her whole con was to secure her finances but you're going after a family that has none. So wouldn't you abandon the con at some point or start figuring out like, ooh, okay, maybe I need to like work my way into a different family. So what exactly was her plan? Even that, like, how is that securing her finances? Like, sure, she would join their family, but like, I don't know, was she planning on like cleaning out their bank account? I, I still, I don't understand. I'm actually not even sure if I understand Ren's full motivation or if I missed it. Like the back cover says it's to secure her finances, but we don't really see that or we don't see her really focused on that or working on it. I will say it's also extremely convenient to the plot and very lucky for Ren that no one, literally no one, tried to contact the house that she says she's from to verify her legitimacy. I understand that her supposed mother is estranged from the family, but 
surely there's someone else they could try to contact to verify that she exists. Like, I don't know, her father, a servant that works at the house, a friend, other noble families. It just, it's very convenient. I will say I also did not really start liking this until page 70, which on the one hand did save it because I gave myself until page 100 or I was going to DNF it. It just, there were so many scenes that I wanted to know why we were there, what point did it serve, why are we spending time on this, like, let's keep the plot moving here a little bit faster. So, kind of talking about, like, plot and slowness, and again, tying back to Ren's motivation, we have the character of Liato, who's like her cousin, or supposed cousin. I really did like him. So, of course, he's the one who dies in the book. Like, thanks for that, authors. <laughs> He was kind of a bit of like a brooding bad boy sometimes and the times I really liked him was he was just very funny and playful and like realized his life is kind of ridiculous and his privilege and just pokes fun at it in a way and just has a good time where instead of like some of the other characters are really stuffy about all of their stuff and ooh, being prim and proper and he's just kind of he's just there for a good time. I liked him. I wasn't as sold on his budding romance with the woman he thinks is his cousin. It's not established in this world that that's a normal practice, especially since it doesn't sound like any other noble families like marry that way. Like it kind of sounds like they all marry different families to secure their finances and build stronger communities. So just it felt really off for his thought process to be like, cool, my dad's sister's daughter. Like I should hook up with her. Like stop Liato like please just no no don't I think one thing that kind of gave it away that there's two authors writing this is some of the dialect and some of the characters the way they speak like there are some characters that kind of talk like Yoda like their words are switched around like it still ends up making sense and you can understand it but like I, I didn't get that especially since most like it's only like few characters so 98% of the characters speak one way and then there's just these few that do it it just it felt very weird I did see a review by a user named idiomatic on goodreads that essentially said the naming conventions and language were a distracting mess you've got your Venetian masks and your Polish or Czech peasants and your Latin nobles but frankly, between the extremely cream tea and calling cards social circuit and the street urchin speaking pure Victorian, Oi, mister, you me dad, it all felt complicated. Or it all felt like complicated spackle over a setting with pretty traditional instincts. And I have to agree. Again, it's, I understand that they're probably painting the picture of the disparate classes, but it just, I don't know. It, also, it just it felt like a jumbled mess. Moving on the magic system. There's a magic system. It's there. I, I, I can't explain it to you. I don't understand it. Where does it come from? Why can only some people read the not tarot cards? Like there's essentially tarot cards, but they're not called that. Um, and then there's another form of magic, Numenata or something, Numenatria. It's essentially runes. I'm going to call it runes because that's what, what I think it is. Like, can everyone draw them? I surely don't know. There are tons of descriptions of Ren doing readings and talking about these cards, but they mean nothing to me. It also seems like each card is tied to a god or goddess. Why? Why is it so complicated? Why are there so many forms of magic in this? There's the not tarot cards, runes. Then there's the dream magic. Speaking of the dream magic, let's go back to the back cover copy for a second, okay? As corrupt nightmare magic begins to weave its way through the city of dreams, the poisonous feuds of its nobility and the shadowy dangers of its impoverished underbelly become tangled, with Ren at their heart. The dream magic does not happen until like halfway through the book. So the fact that that is what is selling this book, and then it doesn't show up until probably like page 300. What? Like, why wasn't that a stat? Like, I guess, okay, I will give them credit. They do drop like one little hint with like the little boy who's complaining that he can't sleep. But that's it. Like, otherwise we do not get into the dream magic stuff and like the city of dreams and all of this stuff until way later. 
like the runes and the not tarot cards get more world building around it and then it's they just try and make them all work in the same universe but i don't get it it really felt like the authors wanted this deep complex magic system but could not agree how it was based so they just did whatever they liked and it doesn't add up it doesn't make sense it they all don't work well together speaking of magic how was okra alive the book starts with ren poisoning her so essentially okra is like this leader of this little children gang and to get away from it ren poisons her and runs away with her sister so how'd she survive like they tried answering it with like Later when she appears, like, she's in another, she's in the nightmare realm or something. Like, how'd she get there? And then it explains, like, she's surviving because she basically ate, ate these, like, nightmare demon things. But, again, how'd she get there? How'd she get her hands on one of these things? And there's a lot of them, like, Z Zilzin, Zizlin, I don't know, what, uh, nightmare demons is what I'm going to call them. She eats one of them, and that's how she explains, like, how she's tied to this world. But there's a lot of them. Like, imagine, like, season two of Stranger Things, like, the demo dogs. It's like that. There's so many of these little things that are, like, they all work together. Wouldn't they want to kill her after she ate one of their own? Like, you think they would have attacked her, like, because then later it's explained that, like, she's in control of them. But how? <sighs> Beats me climax of the book i really had no idea what was going on we're like in this dream state so essentially they take like this potion or drink or whatever and then they can slip into a shared dream essentially but it's also a nightmare but it's also a parallel plane to our own reality because seams are starting to open up and like the nightmare is bleeding into reality so is it a dream or is it not then there are like different parts of our spirit that can go stay in the dream i just i don't i don't get it i don't get it there's way too much going on in this i do not know what is happening in this book i can't remember who everyone is i don't understand the politics i just don't understand how it all works it is too much too soon for the first book in a series I'm going to compare it to Harry Potter again. We were thrown into the world of wizards and witches, but it was explained. And it was, and it like built upon itself. It got more complex the further into the world we went. Whereas this, this just kicks you into the deep end and hopes you can swim. Again, I understand wanting to create this rich fantasy realm, but there has to be something tying me to reality or there has to be some way I can immerse myself in that world too. And just pretending that I'm an observer while these people live their lives doesn't bring me in the way that it should. Also on kind of the magic system, we're going back to the magic system, there's one of the characters, Vargo, who's like a crime boss who wants to work his way into the nobility. He hears projections of someone else's thoughts in his head. Okay, cool. But how? Like, it's a mystery because there's a character in it also that's like a Robin Hood stand-in called the Rook. And I actually like the Rook. The Rook is a cool character. So I felt like it was done to be a mystery, so you assume that Vargo is the Rook because they kind of explain, like, the Rook is like Zorro, like new people just kind of take up the mantle and continue doing his work. But in this world, again, since there's like your spirit is broken into seven freaking parts or something, I don't know, like essentially like, yeah, it's a real person, but they're possessed by the spirit of the Rook and that's what continues it on. So I think it was just done as a misdirect to be like, oh, well, obviously Vargo must be him because he's hearing the spirit talk to him. And then we find out that it's not him. And so then who is this Alcius character that's projecting thoughts into Vargo's head? How can he see outside of himself? Who, like, do, I, I don't even know if we, like, figured out who it was. Maybe that's a mystery that's being saved for book two or three. But I don't know. But it's not explained and it's not wrapped up neatly even after we do find out the identity of the Rook. Which, honestly, if you read it, you'll probably be able to guess who it is. It's, they're not hiding it very well. 
Moving on to other characters. There, so there's so many plots happening in this book. So yeah, part of the, what is it? The poisonous fuse of its nobility. So essentially, yeah, there's a noble family and then there's Vazranians. Again, I am not saying this probably how it's supposed to be said, but there's this one house, the Indesters, and essentially you find out like, yeah, they're just trying to get rid of the Vaz Vazranians, Vazranians, whatever. Doesn't, doesn't he kind of need them to stay intact? Like it's a very colonizing story. Like, yep, these white people came in, took over colored people's homelands and kind of subjugated them. Okay, but again, for him to have his position of power, there has to be someone under him. And then he also has a son who's like hooking up with this girl that's in like this rebellion group. I'm not even going to try and say the stupid name because I don't know how to pronounce it. But why would this group trust his son? Like it just, it felt very juvenile for this to be the main political intrigue in the book. Like, yeah, Papa and Dester is, I hate poor people. Like, what? And then again, like, this rebellion group, they're obviously smart. They're, like, using magic to disseminate their information, to get people to come together to do a protest. But sure, they're going to trust the son of one of their enemies who basically tells them, like, I hate you, I hope you die, and you should leave this country, even though this is your country originally. And especially, like, the son's not even trying his best like I could understand it a lot more if it was like he had left his family home he was standing with them he was speaking out and he was doing other political moves against his dad to really get people to be like oh yeah maybe he is on our side but nope he's still attending parties he's still living in his dad's house why would they trust him it just it makes them look like idiots when I think we're supposed to be on their side but I, I don't know uh, another character that just kind of, again, I don't understand their motivation. Like, I cackled, literally cackled, during Okra's mustache twirling monologues at the end. Like, she's basically telling Ren, like, I just wanted you to be my daughter. And, like, I'm such a good mother. What? 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 <laughs> like, it just, that doesn't make any sense given what we saw of okra and ren's relationship like it just i i i don't i don't get it and it just it really felt like the authors both had really cool ideas which is great that's fantastic but then they didn't pare down those ideas and simplify it to cohesive story it was just like i like this and i'm putting it in i like this i'm shoehorning that in oh i want this to be the way this is done so i'm adding it. oh i like this character they're gonna be in it like and I will say, again, kudos to, for me getting through this because it has actually now made me take a look at one of the books I'm writing because it, my characters were getting away from me. I was making too complex a world, too many characters trying to do different things that it's like, okay, an outside reader probably, they're not in my head. They don't understand. They can't see the whole picture that I can. So I need to make sure that this story is as clean cut as possible so people can actually follow it, understand who the key players are and want to be invested in this. This kind of makes me lose interest pretty fast. I honestly feel like when they were working together, it must have been like pulling a Tim gun, like make it work, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work when there are too many directions that this book is taking. Am I supposed to be thinking about the con? Am I supposed to be thinking about the dream nightmare magic subplot? The clash between the classes? The Rook? The Robin Hood character? Like, it's just there's too much going on. Subplots are important for books. It gives us time to breathe, take a step away, build out the world a little bit more, supplement the main plot. I love me a good B-plot. But this, this book had subplots from A to Z. And they're all fighting for the main attention. So, again, given the back cover copy, it almost sounds like the nightmare magic stuff is supposed to be the main part of it. But it's really not. Or at least that's not how it came across to me. If I had to summarize this book in a single word, it would be dense. Dense and overly complex. I guess that's two words with a hyphen. I'm also going to say that this is a very small nitpick and I'm aware that this is something that probably just bugged me to no end. 
But I'm going to bring it up. Why are so many books lately breaking themselves up into parts when it adds nothing to the story? Literally nothing. I do not understand why there were four parts to this book. Why did more trees have to die for the stylistic choice that does nothing for the actual story or the book? I, I could not tell you the difference of what the four parts actually equal. I don't, like, I don't know if it was supposed to be like, okay, this subplot is wrapped up and so now we're moving into part two. But they weren't. All the plots stretched the entire length of the story. <sighs> so a few good things. I will say if you love Renfest or like the cosplay side of stuff, you're probably going to love the lovingly detailed descriptions of clothing. I swear, I know more about Ren's masks and her dresses that Tess is making than how this magic, how any of the magic systems work in this book. I also really did like the normalization of LGBTQ plus characters. Like, there are some characters who are gay and no one bats an eye at it. It just is what it is. That's just a way of life. Like, nobody cares that two women are at a ball dancing together or that two men are going off to hook up. Nobody cares. The nobles have, if it, the noble is a man, he might have a husband. Great. Who cares? Like, I really did appreciate that and not something that you typically see in fantasy or at least not the fantasy I've read. So it was great. I've also seen really good things about book two when I was doing my deep dive Goodreads reviews. And I hope others enjoyed it as I will not be continuing this series. This was 630 pages and it took me a very long time to get through it. I'm not investing any more time. Again, I'm glad to see that book two is a lot better, but this one just really did not set me up for success with this series. I also really think that it's a shame that I'm not continuing it because the authors obviously put a lot of effort and thought into this book. Again, it has a freaking glossary. Obviously things have been planned and again, there was a lot of thought put into it, but it feels like it's just too much. Like it just, it comes on really strong. It's almost like that episode of Frasier, which is one of my favorite shows. And I've seen every season probably like two or three times, but there's an episode where Frasier is trying to woo this woman and be really romantic with her. So he sends her flowers, brings her flowers, serenades her in public, like just doing all these big romantic gestures and it's overwhelming, which is a bit funny as I do think most of the plot is slow as molasses in this book. Like you could probably cut the first 200 pages, 200. And I don't think that the story would suffer that much as a result. Like the first part of the book, we're mostly watching Ren insinuate herself in high society and have tea and go to parties. Great, but it's, it's slow and dull. And again, it's just with all the different plots happening, because most of that stuff is about the con. But again, I don't know if the con is supposed to be the main, main plot line of the book because there's so many other plot lines vying for attention. So I will say again, on good side, the ideas are there. The characters are there. I just think it would have benefited from maybe being broken out even further than just a trilogy, because this is book one of three. Break it up even more. Have it be a series of five books. Like in book one, have Ren pull her con, but in Dester or whoever the hell is pulling his crap, Ren figures it out, saves them, and then win, wins favor with the Trementis family that she's conning. Book two is where Okra from her past threatens her con now, now that she's deeper into it and others are getting potentially closer to figuring out that she's not who she says she is, the first one can have the not tarot cards that help her figure out Indestor's plans. And then book two is about the rune-based magic and how it seals the difference between the nightmare world and our reality. It builds and it gives us as the readers a little bit more breathing room. So I will ask, have you read The Mask of Mirrors by M.A. Carrick? Let me know what you thought of the first book of the series by leaving a comment below. I am off to go finish the, this bottle of wine and get this book out of my head. But otherwise, I'll see you next time on Wine Club. Music